I remember standing behind the block, probably one of the highlights of my career, it was like nothing was going to stop me getting on the team. It was just like, just that complete like utter belief and like killer instinct of just like, oh, well, fuck everyone else. I actually, um, I went to start writing an intro for you. We usually introduce our guests and, and I started and I'm like, what's the, what's the point? <laughs> like you won gold. Like what, what do I need to, <laughs> yeah, what yeah. do I need to introduce? So Zach's a lady cook, 2,200, 2000. 2000. 2000. 200 meter breaststroke, Olympic gold medal winner, Tokyo 2020. You also won the bronze in the 4x100 mixed medley yep. uh, in Tokyo. Welcome back. Welcome, Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a nice collection of hardware you've got there. Yeah, nice and shiny. <laughs> yeah, very That's shiny. That's amazing. And it's a composition of used electronics. Yep. So, yeah, the donation of Japanese public, like, very, very grateful for the Japanese public to put so much on hold and let alone just don't then donate all their all electronics to, yeah, present the medals and make all the medals. Um, so the gold is gold plated. I'm not sure what the bronze comp is, but yeah, and that's Nike on the front. So the Greek goddess of victory. Not many people know that. Is I that a, is to be that fair, really? I didn't know that either. Yeah. I'd heard about that recently. And that's like a great branding thing. It's just like, ah, every, every medal winner. We'll, we'll be wrapping our brand and you may not even know it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Too good, eh? <laughs> yeah, so, so Nike is the Greek god. Of victory. Of victory. Greek goddess, yeah, of victory. I think it predates the brand though, you know. Probably, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, which code first? Chicken or the egg? Yeah. That <laughs> yeah, that's insane. And um, so like when you started swimming, you're saying you're around nine when you started competitively. And then from there, you were doing very well until... Matt Wilson came onto the scenes and sort of shook things up. Yeah, definitely. He um, <laughs> run us through that. Yeah, so for me, it was like I was nine till I was about 12, 12, between 12 and 13 and was doing really well with myself and breaking records, like in the records that still stand. And I'm still well, probably good. like, you know, like some of the highlights. I'm like, wow, like I was 13 and did that. I was like, really? Doesn't make sense. So, what, what are the highlights? Oh, probably there was a hundred breaststroke um, when I was thirteen at states, and I was like one hundred five eight, and I'm like I'm only a fifty nine eight ish um, now, so yeah. that's ten years on. Wow. <laughs> <And it's> like, <laughs> which I guess that like for the non swimmer goes to show just the the small margins that you're working with and trying to improve upon. Yeah. So and then like as you said, Matt came through, and I kind of like stepped back a little bit, and like was a bit frustrated, I think, and going through a few things in my life and that was like I didn't know whether I wanted to keep swimming was quite lazy with it and didn't really know how to progress um for me it was like how how do I take the next step into it and I kind of like Matt to be honest if he wasn't there like I wouldn't be where I am now because he's like forced me to know what hard work is and know Mm. how to get the best out of myself and challenge myself to be the best um so yeah like I guess 2014 to 2017, no, 19, 18, sorry. Leading up to the Com Games? <laughs> yeah, so after the Commonwealth Games, that's the first time I beat him from 2014. So it was a four-year kind of project. Wow, um, I like that a project. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I and, like that. And um, yeah, it was it was a, like we've always enjoyed racing each other. Like we've been racing since we were nine. So and now we're right, like it was surreal to be able to share an olympic experience with him it was just like dude we've yeah. been racing since we're like nine ten years old and like we're both 23 like 22 23 now and racing each other it's like what what where, where yeah. are we living like this is weird <laughs> like sitting on the bus just like looking back and being like we're both like olympians now and like we both had that dream and we both pushed each other to get the best out of each other so wow. yeah wow that's really cool so like being defeated, not I don't want to say like defeated, but like from, challenged. from yeah, <laughs> being challenged, being challenged for the first time, challenged, challenge winning. Like like, how do you take that mentally? Because how do you how do you keep being motivated to work on work on yourself and, and begin that project, that four year project? Yeah, for me, it was is is it's only a project in hindsight, if you will, because you know when you're twelve, thirteen. You, you don't necessarily think of it like that. It's more like you're just enjoying it for what it is. And, you know, some of your friends, you know, would attest to this who you went to school with. And, like, we were always just enjoying the sport and enjoying getting the best out of ourselves and enjoying the challenge of getting that out of each other. And the camaraderie that came with that is definitely probably, like, 
what pushes you in that mm. regard. But then I guess for me, when I had shoulder surgery in 2015, 16, the end of 15, um, it kind of made me go, what do I want out of the sport? Um, and that like having those things might be pretty shitty at the time, but it, it's those things that make you like take a step back from the sport and take a step back from those things and go, well, why do I enjoy it? And then what do I want to get out of it? And for me, that was one of the first kind of turning points where I was like, okay, I want to keep doing this. I don't want to stop and just kind of be like, well, that's enough. And I want to push myself and get the best out of myself. So for me, that's what motivates me day in, day out is like getting the best out of myself. And I've described it as like, some people get it and some people are like, what are you talking about? But like trying to find that edge where like, you're almost like chasing the pain of like the rabbit of pain like down the rabbit hole and just like finding where like you're about to break like mm. if that it, it sounds uh, yeah, like no, I, know, I know exactly what you mean <laughs> yeah it's uh there's a saying it's how can you know how much no what is it it's, if you if you don't it bite off more than you can chew how will you know how much you can fit in your mouth yeah and i, I feel like true, it's the same very, thing very um and that you've you'll figure it out like what you can and can't do in terms of like physical um capabilities but yeah you got to get yourself there to know what you're, what's really possible. Exactly. And I think like if you if you go in with a limit, you can't like expect to come out with like anything better than what you expected. Exactly. So for me, that's what it is. It's like just trying to push that edge a little bit and like hone in that edge of where I'm like balancing on it. That's, yeah. that's, that's kind of the way I try to like visualize it as well and just like pushing myself and challenging myself day in, day out. And yeah, as you become a senior athlete, that's kind of, how it all works like you you go from training with like when i was at when i was at school it was like a group of nearly 30 people and then it's like train with a group of six <laughs> <laughs> everyone just withers away yeah so and like the group of six it's like i'm like there was two breaststrokers now there's none like just except myself um and then all freestyle and backstrokers so it's like okay i've got to like push myself mm. and know what where i need to be and what like in terms of like analysis of it all and like i need to be hitting this time of training to be able to do this in a race and ultra disciplined yeah and accountable yeah do you have anyone else holding yourself accountable then yeah definitely my coach and the the team behind me is definitely like like oh you know like this is what we need to be doing for the pace work and stuff is definitely like my coach has a quite a obviously a big input and we we both share like we'll sit down at the start of the season and go well i think this is what's what the goal is and what we think we're capable of and go from there and build into that. And then like, you know, that's just, just the swimming side of it. But then you've got like strength and conditioning of like, okay, I reckon this will help me do this in the pool. Mm. So say like a big, a big thing for me before the Olympics was leg strength because of my starts. I wanted to build that up a bit more, but we'd have issues with it in the past that my back would play up when we would do too much like back squatting. So we, we found a way around that of just doing leg press and, really building up that and it was a lot quicker and it, it all just kind of like those puzzles fit together and then on top of that you know you have your physio and like okay how can we maintain this how just, can we ensure that you're getting everything you can out of the pool and doing uninterrupted week after week training and then we have biomechanics as well like so that's like starts turns and finishing well and then how you're moving through the water as well so for other people like you know that would be like how you hold the cricket bat, like all those little like minute details or like how how you start in, in your running style, exactly, yeah. your stride in running. So those kind of things is what we do in biomechanics. And then we kind of, that team works together to get and then kind of presents the athlete, this is what you want to do. And Is, so, there, any, is there any fight back? Like, is there any situations where, I don't know if it's your coach giving you biomechanical advice or whoever it may be, but it's like actually... I don't think this is the best way to start. Like, mm. is that does that conversation happen yeah, as well? Yeah, I think that's a benefit of the relationship I have with my coach at the moment. Like, and I think that's a really positive relationship in that we can have the pushback, we can have the dialogue between each other of to get the best out of each other. Mm. We need to be having that Constant pushing, communication, pushing and pulling you know and having those compromises of okay well like if we do, if we focus too much on this then this will fall apart and like being clear having clear conversations is definitely like key to that relationship i think like without that 
we w- I wouldn't be where I am and w- I wouldn't be with him either. Um, so yeah, like there's obviously disagreements. I think <laughs> any, any any healthy relationship, yeah. there's always dis- disagreements. But yeah, it's about managing. Yeah, for sure. How that how that plays out, and I think like after five years with five years with him, so it's. It's, it's been, worked. yeah, it's been like <laughs> the first three years were probably a bit like, oh, like push and pull and oftentimes we'd get quite frustrated at each other and both of us are very stubborn characters, so that doesn't help either. And, <laughs> um, but beyond that, like the last two years have been nothing but really, really good and we've both been very understanding of each other and kind of went about it all in the right way with each other. So, yeah. That's awesome. We've got a little game, it's called Over and Under, so where we just blurt out things and you say is it overrated is it underrated or maybe it's like adequately rated so it's very simple don't think on it all right instant coffee uh overrated wow lego underrated Ooh. certified lover boy drake's new album have you listened no it doesn't matter skip <laughs> star wars series uh overrated ufc underrated in australia Ooh, in america you see in America? Ah, uh, it's pretty. I reckon it's 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 pretty amazing. Like yeah, to watch I, I them, love it. To watch them fight like in so many different disciplines, it's like what like, and to like, people say boxing is risking your life, but like, I don't think it, UFC. <laughs> yeah, it's like, and like I don't know if you've listened. To, I've listened to Joe Rogan did a podcast with um, one of the referees, and he was like, mm-hmm. sometimes he couldn't hear him, hear the bells and stuff, and it's just like. So how does he know when to stop? Like <laughs> these two are like trying to kill each other. Probably like <laughs> Herb Dean or whatever, like yeah. where where they have to just they have to feel and just know exactly what's going on all yeah. the time. It's insane. Very insane. Hiking. Underrated. Ooh. Music festivals? Overrated. The pub? Underrated. The radio? Standard. <laughs> Netflix? <laughs> Standard. <laughs> Game of Thrones. Overrated. Santa. <laughs> Oh, standard. <laughs> <laughs> the Olympics. Uh, standard. Standard, adequately rated. Yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah, okay, that's think. fair. Gets its respect when it comes around. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm a big fan. Uh, uh, two things there. Instant coffee. I think it's underrated. The, just the, the cost to pick up satisfaction is just... <laughs> Is just there. You might um, be the only person that instant coffee. It's disgusting. It's, it's, it's so gross. It's, it's so gross. But there's instant specialty now. Yeah. I'm a big coffee nerd, and there's like specialty coffee that people are trying to like basically muck around with. It would do like a really high end specialty coffee and make it instant. So that could how be. That, that could be. That, a niche. that could be the future. That could be. How does that? Um, what's the like cost quality look wise? <laughs> oh, it's more way more expensive. It's like basically going out for coffee. Like, Okay, instant. but but that's instant though. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Yeah. So you buy sachets? Yeah, yeah. You'll buy like either a tin or a sachet of like a specialty instant from a like a nice roaster. So Wolf Coffee used to do one. I'm not sure if they still do, but um, they're a Brizzy roaster and they used to do it like a specialty instant, one of their specialty blends of, of that season. So they will do like a Brazil Colombia kind of blend or something like that, and then they will just make it into like a high quality instant. Do you, Do you have a favorite region like? With your coffee, like, um, how deep of a like a coffee? Or how deep? That's a weird one. <laughs> how, how like deep does your coffee love go? I think yeah, that's okay, okay, that's fair. Yeah, yeah, that's, fair. Well. that's fine. That's, fine. That's, a, that's a nice way to put it. Yeah. That's how you think about it. But um, I'll say this: I when I went to Japan, I took a kettle, I took a, gr- a coffee grinder, like a hand grinder, a set of scales, and I brought like two kilos of coffee. <laughs> let's fucking go because yeah. I was like I, <laughs> I don't want to risk like me not having good coffee so I was yeah. like it was just like something that I always travel with is that um, but at the moment like yeah I'm having a lot of Kenya a lot of Ethiopia a lot of ethers um, and I've got a Colombian rum rum age thing that I've got in the cold brew actually just before fuck I came. yeah <laughs> fuck yeah that's mad so how do you source your coffee beans do you like do you know what you're getting before you get it yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. as in like oh, i'll just buy coffee yeah, yeah. but you yeah, like no i want i want something from this region in the same way that wine people will go about purchasing wine yeah yeah often like oh i have a few like favorite roasters and they're the go-tos so i'll go to their like go have a look at their websites and stuff and check what they've got and what regions they've got and what flavor profiles they've got like i'm a big fan of trying a lot of variety of different coffees and don't like like i've been quite interested in like like i only drink filter so like black 
black like American style coffee. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I thoroughly like enjoy the variety and having like different flavor profiles. Like say like the one I was drinking on the way here was like a mojito like kind of flavor profile. And it was like, it, it actually tastes like that. It's like, yeah, it doesn't really taste like coffee. So like it's got that coffee on the surface, but then it has like nice undertones of all different pieces. So still you, gives you the kick. Still gives you the yeah, coffee kick and yeah. you get that feeling, but... Yeah, is there is there a particular flavor profile you like to go towards? I'm a very like classic like chocolate cherry, and I don't I don't love the floral, um, like tea kind of coffees, which are like the super high end ones anyway that are really fucking expensive. And it's like, <laughs> well, oh well, it's kind of good. I don't like them, um, but yeah, like definitely definitely that kind of flavor profile. Like one of the best coffees I've ever had was like a blueberry passion fruit and white chocolate, which sounds like weird for a coffee, but like. The white chocolate was like, you know, when you eat white chocolate and you just get that, like, the whole coat of the, your mouth? Yes. Oh, the yeah. full yeah. mouth feel. <laughs> yeah. It was that. <sighs> like, wow. You'd have it and you're just like, what? Did I just eat <laughs> chocolate? Like, it was it was really nice. And it was like, yeah. Where, yeah. where are you getting your coffees from? Because... Mostly Melbourne roasters, to be fair. <laughs> so you just order them in. They're just yeah, like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. this stuff is sounding good. Like, it's sounding better than that it's instant... It's a rabbit hole, though. Makona, <laughs> Makona <laughs> shit that you bring to work and that yeah. I sometimes suffer and like, all right, well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Guess we're doing this. A little bit of milk. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, don't, I don't go for the milk because I find that it just slows me down. I feel a bit lethargic <laughs> from it. I don't know. Uh, but, um, just a dash of milk. Dash of milk will slow you down. Mm, it's a know. mindset, hey? Yeah. So, what, so why don't you add the milk? <laughs> I don't know. Well, when I'm racing, I don't like... Like, I don't really have any dairy yeah. products, really. So, it's like, just, yeah. That's what I said to you. You need to cut the dairy. Carbs, vegetables, and, like, protein. Yeah. It's like, that's the basic. Yeah. yeah I'll cut the dairy when I'm racing, Luke. Yeah. Same <laughs> kind of thing when I get there. So, 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 when you went to the Com Games 2018, how, talk to me through that. You, you came yeah. fifth in the heats. Um, how were you expecting to go? How was the whole experience? Uh, like, yeah, that was probably the second turning point. So I kind of like touched on the turning point. First turning point being Matt Wilson. The, the shoulder kind of surgery. Okay. Shoulder um, reconstruction, 2017, like, 2016. Uh, 15. Oh, sorry, so yeah. I had a tumor, a spindle cell lipoma in my left shoulder. It's left, is it? <laughs> Nailed it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was like about the size, just bigger than a golf ball. Um, oh, it was just a little tumor. So that was like the shoulder surgery and kind of, just... kind of put me out for three months ish and then kind of took me probably another three to recover like properly to be back where i was yeah. um so a bit of time and but the second then turning point was was com games having a very average is the polite way to say <laughs> it, um swim and not doing what i knew i was capable of so, so f- for me i knew i was kind of probably capable of getting on the podium at that point um and i kind of just got a bit starstruck and caught up in the bubble of com games and the home games and knowing that I could do something special and I could kind of have that breakout year, but like I just didn't mentally go into it in the right way. And for me, that was probably one of the biggest lessons I've had to learn and something that without com games, I probably wouldn't have learned is how to approach a meet like properly and how to get the best out of myself and how to get the best out of myself in a village environment where you're constantly around everyone and you're constantly like in this bubble of like just energy. Yeah. So, so what is the way to approach that then? For me, like now I kind of like know the people I like hanging out with on the team as well. Like that, that's a big thing. But creating some familiarity. Yeah. Creating familiarity and like creating those routines and habits when you are there. So like the coffee is like a big part of that. It's just like in the morning I'll get up, make that in the afternoon like before we race i'll do the same and like it's very like process orientated so that's me to a t is process obsession like that's me yeah <laughs> um and that helps feed that value of and that that point in my life that i need to be doing something else in order to get the best out of myself and i've like recently been doing a lot of like i've been taking like buying a lego kit and taking it away so i'm not like sitting in front of a screen for like six hours of resting and just like listening to a podcast or listening to music and just like just doing Lego and like yeah it's like mind on you can't really be doing much else yeah and you're just like like doing a puzzle basically and keeping away from a screen so it's kind of like a nice balance create a hobby for yourself yeah so busy yeah and it's like 
also like a nice thing that you'll n- normally finish. I didn't finish it in Tokyo. It was a bit busy, <laughs> but um, <laughs> how's it go with transporting it then? I like just carried, like when I was with trials, I just carried it on. Like <laughs> afterwards, I just like carried it on and took it home and like had this big Porsche. <laughs> it was like that big. And like all the people were like, what is the fuck is this 22 year old carrying like a Porsche Lego? But like a couple of the Qantas people were like, oh, that's fucking sick. I, was like, <laughs> I think it probably helps that you got a gold medal. Like they, they can't exactly like diss it. You work yeah. something out. Lego's yeah. got some kind of correlation to this. Yeah, yeah. It was, um, yeah, so that's what I've like learnt from Commonwealth Games. It was like probably a big low point too. Like I came back, I came back after Commonwealth Games and was like, oh, do I really want to do keep doing this? And it was like I was depressed. I like came to training, was having panic attacks, anxiety attacks, and like was my mind was just like, how the hell can I just get out of it here? Mm. And that was like, I think a combination of a few things like not being successful, kind of like not having much else going on in my life apart from swimming and swimming yeah, um, and not having that balance that I've built in now and something to kind of be like, well, if I don't have this, I've got this. So now that's definitely where I'm at. But then I was, yeah, all eggs in one basket. And in saying that, I kind of like had that turning point of like, because our Pampax is about three months after that, after Commonwealth Games. So we had a fairly packed program that year and I kind of like was like, all right, well, I'm going to throw everything at Pampax, try and get on the team because it's actually harder to get on the Pampax team than it is in the Commonwealth Games team. Mm, So to get on the Pampax team, you have to be in the top eight in the world and to get on the Commonwealth Games team, you kind of have to just be top three in Australia. So yeah, it's like everyone... Creating a a new goal for yourself to to get back fully into it. Yeah, so I, I said to myself, okay, all right, like, at that point I was working still like very most weekends occasionally like during the week and then I was studying probably not where I wanted to be and or not what I wanted to be doing and I thought I wanted to be doing that and I was kind of like in that transitional period of mm. your life when you kind of finish high school and you're like oh, which way <laughs> is up like yeah. where, where am I going um so for me that's where I was at and the combination of all that and getting caught up in the hype of Commonwealth Games and then I remember how nervous I was and like walking out and going, oh shit. And then like just diving in and knowing that I'd swum that race over and over in my head before I even got there. And it, it just was, yeah, not a good period. And then beyond that, I like kind of said to myself, all right, well, I'm going to do everything I can for Pampax and throw everything I can at Pampax. And if I land where I am, that's, that's what I want to do. And we'll reassess after that. So I kind of like pulled away work, kept studying, very part-time but kept kept a little bit of balance and then kind of threw everything at swimming and and then i was like i remember standing behind the block at pampax trials and probably one of the highlights of my career it was like i can just remember the feeling it's like nothing was going to stop me getting on the team it was just like you just like uh i like just that complete like utter belief and like killer instinct of just like oh fuck everyone else Let's. I'm, I got goosebumps right now. Yeah. Yes. That willpower. Uh, yeah. Like after having that shit experience, it was like that was the real like. All right, I can I can do this and moving forward and then like, pan packs. Obviously, I had quite a bit of success and it was kind of like my breakthrough meet and like, that was for me just like compounding on proving to myself that it was like I was possible to put my mind to something and keep keep going with it. So yeah, like, for me that was such a big year for me and such a big turning point in my career and something that definitely has helped me to get where I am now. So it was mainly like driven by your just internal belief. That was the main motivating thing. You're like, it was your own willpower where you didn't like source other people saying, no, you got to keep at this. You got to keep going. It was mainly you being able to tell yourself, no, I mean, I, want to keep I mean, going with this. yeah, I, I don't, I don't want to say that like the people around me didn't help me at all because like without them, I definitely wouldn't be here. But yeah. in saying that, like the support network I have is very much like they'll love me no matter what, mm. I guess is, is, the, Com- is the, it's too comfortable. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a comfortable, it's, thing a, it's a great own, environment, but that's what you like. It's ideally what you want. And if you've got that own internal drive, yeah. you'll push through. Yeah, exactly. And they, the I think they the kind of knew that I had the internal drive and they were definitely there for the bad times and the good times. But and that's the thing like they love me the same no matter whether mm. I'm, I'm successful or not like it's not like anything changed in that part of my life they were just there more supportive than ever and knowing that I wanted to get to Pampax and I wanted to put everything 
to get there, they fully supported that. And that was something that I'm very grateful for. So yeah, like they didn't necessarily go, well, like I know a few people like my partner and mum and dad all kind of like said to me, you know, like you can do this and you've got this and they never doubted. But then it was like to get yourself over the line, you know, like my coach said to me something before the, the Olympics, it was like one's enough. And mm. it's like something that's I don't think said often enough that it's like the pressure of yourself, that's enough. Yeah. Like yeah. you have enough internal voices. It's just like, <laughs> I don't, uh, you, like you, can, you can hear everyone else, but one is more than enough to get the best out of yourself, I think, and to, to put enough pressure on yourself. So absolutely, yeah, you know, like it's not that prefer like some people say pressure is a privilege, and I completely agree. But at the same time, like you create your own pressure, and you you can create your own atmosphere and your own drive. It's all upstairs in your head. Mm, yeah, and sometimes it is just like in that race in particular. It's just like, well, I know I can do this. I just need to get out of my own way. Was that did that take it. that mindset up on the blocks? Did that take months to harness that? that energy or was it just something that showed up no it was definitely you're 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 cultivating this killer instinct yeah yeah. when i was like when i went to the doctor after commonwealth games and was depressed and told him about the panic attacks and everything and he recommended going to a psych and i started seeing a psych and i chose someone that was outside of the pool so kind of like it was really good to be outside of the pool because there was no like perspective on like oh you know like swimming's great and everything but like you have to over explain it when you over explain something you're just like oh it's actually not that bad yeah like, or, it, or it's like you know those kind of things so for me i sought someone outside of the pool and to deal with those issues and then build upon that to get the best out of myself both in and out of the pool um is something that i've worked on and i'm still working on with him and he's been there since commonwealth games so since that turning point and yeah it's definitely a testament to him getting that out of me and learning to just get out of my own way and like having not necessarily less stress or less pressure, but learning to manage it and learning to manage expectations and learning to be accountable to and learning what other people like telling, needing to tell like, okay, mom, I'm only going to text you like once a day or like I'm just going to check in once a day when I'm on team or same with my partner. Like I'll I'll message you when I can, but you know, Mm. like it's, it's not going to be all the time because I am busy and, like them understanding that a bit more and having those expectations with all the how other you, people around you. How do you create you. those expectations with your partner? You just said that. Because it's just, yeah. You just say like, well, yeah. I'm like... Because even like training. even in like normal people's lives when it like comes to simping, it's like, why are you simping? <laughs> yeah. and, and it's like an expectation gets established earlier in the relationship where they'll drop everything for each other. Yeah, and definitely like that's the relationship I have with my partner when I'm at home. But when I'm in over there and she knows like I'm trying to get the best out of myself and knows that like I want to get the absolute best out of myself and in order to do that xyz needs to happen so being transparent and upfront with that and knowing and having someone so understanding and you know she's come from a sporting background as well so that definitely helps and then like on top of that being quite upfront and being like okay this is my plan these are my things that I'm using to distract myself and like not distract myself but, but like put that mental energy mm-hmm. into um during racing and ensuring i'm not overthinking so having those things and knowing that it's very transparent amongst your support team um is is managing those expectations yeah absolutely yeah so then so then you you do well in you're, you're on the blocks with that killer instinct pull that off and then what's the next two years two three years Leading three, into Tokyo, yeah. three, three years, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so yeah, after Pampax, it was kind of a bit of a like, wow, well, like, I don't know, like, I, I'm, I still don't think that's the best out of myself and wanted to keep keep progressing, obviously. And then we had World Championships in 2019. Um, yeah, 19. Um, and we kind of wanted to be in the top five because we knew that would be a good placing to get the best out of myself at the Olympic Games. Like, it'd be a good progression because I'd never been to World Champs. Like, it was another step up from Pampax and there was a lot more people involved. And, yeah, like, I know that it's like, it's like Pampax and the progression kind of was Pampax. Like, Commonwealth Games is, like, kind of our lowest tier and then it's Pampax World Championships and then the Olympics. 
Mm. That's kind of like the tiered system of swimming. And for a lot of a lot of the public probably go Olympics, Com Games, <laughs> and then like World yeah. Games, Pan Packs. But it's like kind of like almost flipped. Yeah. Um, what, why is that? Uh, it's just What's, the caliber of racing. So Commonwealth Games is only the Commonwealth. So it's and it's only three in the country, whereas Pan Packs is Pan eight Pax in the is, world. Yeah, the top. Yeah, you have to be in the top eight in the world is a qualifying for Pampax. Um, and then... Why, why isn't, like, Pampax shown more? Like, why, why isn't getting the same coverage then? Like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Olympics a, has better marketing. Yeah, <laughs> Olympics definitely has better But, like, okay, Olympics is the top is the top tier. But, okay, well, if Pampax is second, why isn't it covered like it's the second and not the yeah. comp games or something? Yeah, well, it's it's interesting, too, because it's, it's also, like different for different strokes and so for breaststroke at the time it was definitely kind of probably one of the second best meets in the world in terms of like the caliber of people racing so you had a lot of japanese who are very very good at breaststroke and have quite a big depth so that's like it's like the equivalent to our freestyle here like mm. it's like they just it love goes it. deep yeah they just love it so i'm using that word a lot deep um <laughs> 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 Yeah, they 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 love their breaststroke, so that's a big part of that. And like, they have a lot of depth, so their top two are very very good. <laughs> Where, yeah, you know, so yeah. so having that, and they had the world record at the world record holder at the time. So yeah, like that's where that comes from. But I think in in like backstroke, it's a little different. And mm-hmm. then like, you know, for the freestylers, there might be a couple more Europeans or. Yeah. So then it becomes like world champs is is a, another tier up, and at the moment it's probably is, you know, Olympics world champs, Pan Packs is third, um, just because like for me, there's a lot of Europeans that can like, or Arno like, there's no Japanese or Chinese in the final. Yeah. So it was all European. <laughs> so it was like. Yeah. Yep. If if you were to predict. And uh, yourself, like personal biases aside, how would you have predicted that race, the 200 meter breaststroke race to go down? Uh, I thought Chupkov would be like, I thought him and I would probably be in the middle of the final. I thought it would come down to him and I. I didn't think, I thought Arno would probably have a fight for third. Yeah. Um, if I'm perfectly honest. Um, yeah. And when Chupkov didn't look great in the heat, it was... Um, yeah, it was interesting. Um, and it was just interesting to see the field. Like, there was... Going in, there was six, two oh sixes. Yeah. And coming out, there was one. So, it's quite interesting to see how it all panned out. So, I guess I expected there was going to be a few more people into the final. So, I thought Matt yeah. would be there. I thought Shoma would be there. I thought their other Japanese breaststroker would be in there. Um and I thought Chukov would be right up there, hoping to PB, hoping to break a world record, which I'm sure he was hoping he, to Yeah, do, he probably had those intentions. Yeah, like, after seeing a heat and a semi of him, it was like, I don't know where he is. And mm. him being on the outside was actually quite scary because I was like, I have no idea what, he's, what, is, what he could what do. What the plan is, yeah. Yeah, like, he could be just foxing heat and final and just fucking obliterate everyone so so I'll that go. still happens because i wonder because in swimming the margins are so small like does that foxing happen yeah it happens for sure yeah definitely. like i know that it's a fine line though in swimming like <laughs> yeah like, like you're playing with like tens and like milliseconds yeah absolutely and like you probably saw that even more at this with the past olympics because we had our heats in reverse so mm. the night is typically people swim a little bit faster just because they're more awake a bit more alert and it's just, just that's the way it happens. And that's where it falls, um, and that caused the heats to be a lot more condensed. Yeah. So that top eight, uh, top sixteen into the semi final, or top eight into the final for the next morning, was always a little bit closer Close. than basically since two thousand eight. Yeah. So two thousand eight was the last time they kind of raced that way as well. Um, so yeah, that was the same pattern, which was. Yeah, good to know. Yeah, advanced. interesting. Yeah, that's really cool. So, I feel like so we'll go we'll go back a little bit to Adelaide, the trials. How was that? You 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 take out number one at the trials. You did like a two hundred six twenty eight. Was it? Yeah. Um, I feel like only then were people starting to go. Oh, okay. Like this guy could be a medal contender. 
yeah. how did that feel for you? You're like, guys, I've like been here all along. Like, <laughs> yeah, it was um, it was kind of nice to prove to myself that I could like that swim was in me. Um, mm. because beforehand, like even the worlds, I was like, it was good. Like I got fourth and was happy with fourth con- considering the field, but I thought. I could have probably gone a six then and I thought probably last year I was training like I could swim that and to be able to prove to myself that I could do it and that like what I'd been building towards like each swim throughout this season was there and to to see a little bit of the hard work a glimpse of the hard work kind of pay off and but at the same time like I knew that was just the first step and like people were like oh like really excited for me and I was like yeah but like, <laughs> the job's do not done yeah but. like I've got to do it mm. I've got to step up again in another five weeks and get the best out of myself again so for me it was definitely like like obviously a, quite a high but then like managing that was quite not a, not a how do you bring yourself down after that to uh, go okay go like to training <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's pretty humbling like when you come back you're like oh that's right like it took all of this to get that like it's easy for to forget that I mm. guess like when you have success you're like oh yeah this is sick like I can keep doing this but and it's probably like, harder now nah nah no. not really I'm definitely like all right I'm I, I know like my goals for the next three years and I know that it's going to take a lot and I know kind of where I need to be at in training um in and out of the pool so it's like to get there I know it's a bit of a road and I know that it's not gonna be easy. yeah so so coming out of the com games you had this like what's next sort of thing where you weren't really sure and then realized you had to go f- push for the pan packs whereas now you you know what's what's next and do you feel like post meet from com games to the olympics it's been easier adjusting coming back to training yeah each time it becomes a bit easier like i said to you earlier like before it was like trying to piece those puzzles back together and it becomes easier and easier um like obviously pan packs was was a little bit weird because it was like I, w- I was expecting to go there and just do my best i didn't know what that looked like and to come away with a silver medal was like quite a nice thing and coming back it was piecing that puzzle again together and that gave me a lot of experience and the world champs built on that and then you know coming back from the olympics is definitely built on that to come back down quickly and having the reconnection with my partner for the last two weeks and now coming home and unpacking this morning finally. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, that's why you need that coffee. <laughs> that compress. Yeah. Yeah. So it's definitely like, it's a process and it's something you just like need to just let happen and let, you can't like force it. Mm. And that's something I've had to learn. It's like, you can't just like force it. You can't just like come back and just like be like a hundred miles an hour again. You need to just like slow down for a bit and take a bit of time for yourself and, feel the ups and downs of it all and ensure you are going through those processes. Was there anything coming back that you didn't expect to be the case? Like, or, or you weren't ready for? Like, like we we're, were talking earlier before this about um, just like getting invited to, to corporate gigs. Yeah, it's a, that's it's weird. A strange. <laughs> it's weird, but it's, it's lovely. Like, to me, like I was only saying last night to a few people, it's like, the only reason I believe that like a one is because of the medal that's it it's just like <laughs> what do you mean by that i'll like look so at the medal and be like is like is it real like did that did that actually happen oh it's like true yeah, yeah. Going, it's just, just like dream. that's when the only when proof. i'm gonna wake up yeah that's the only proof yeah it's like it's living a dream and then you're just like when am i gonna wake up <laughs> wow it's like it's it's surreal it's properly surreal and that's what's the biggest thing the biggest like thing i've been like when I mean like where's everything sit it's like in that surrealism it's like well is am I going to wake up it's like almost like that does that kind of make sense like, yeah. yeah 100% yeah you're just like it's unbelievable that I, I never went there expecting I was just always going in wanting to just to do my best and that's like whatever happened and whatever that brought home or didn't bring home I would be happy so it was like this for me like although winning is such an amazing experience it's like i did my best on the day and anyone else could have done their best and beaten me and i would still would have been happy yeah. so for me that's that was always the expectation and will continue to be the mentality i go in with because like i think 
it's clearly tried and tested. But, yeah. <laughs> but in saying that, like, I think it also sets me up to not be, like, to come home and not be too, like, oh, well, what do I do now? Like, mm. and having that experience, like, comp games, you know, like, having that, like, well, do I keep want to keep going? Like, questioning everything. It's like, all right, well, I'll come back. My support system still loves me, like, because I've done the best I could and I'm, like, enjoying myself and being myself in doing that um so yeah like does that kind of make sense yeah that's phenomenal <laughs> it sounds like that's a very awesome. healthy approach too like yeah manage the expectations and be pleasantly surprised when it's like oh shit is this real <laughs> i did better okay good i did my best and it was enough to win yeah. hell yeah that's awesome actually you said one thing in an interview it's uh you can only be the underdog once <laughs> i love that <laughs> yeah yeah that goes <laughs> that's, some, that's, that's some drake line right there like king of the hill now you got to defend that spot yeah, definitely. And like, I was asked this like last night in front of a thousand people and I was like, uh, look, I'm just going to do my best. I'm just going to keep trying to do my That's best. That's not what people want to hear. <laughs> yeah. They're all, they're <laughs> like, like, we're going to smash it. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And especially that, those events where like, they're all talking about 32 and like, how much they're excited about that. And I'm just like, look, I'm, I just want to do my best and represent my country. Yeah. So far away. Yeah, yeah. It's like, I won't be there. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So like, for me, it was always like it's always about representing my best and doing the best I can because like I was only thinking this morning about like you know everyone says everyone works hard and like everyone works to the best of their ability and like just because you're the best on the day like doesn't mean you're the best for the last four years mm, do you know what I mean like, yeah it's a moment in time it's it's literally that point in time and I'm very aware of that and like know that and it's only after a bit of reflection that you kind of like realize that and know that everyone else works just as hard and it could have just as easily been wow. someone else. So like for me, it's like, I just want to keep doing my best. And obviously I, I have goals and have the, kind of the next three years of what I want to do and what I want to achieve. But it's all just about getting the best out of myself day in, day out and finding that edge and yeah, yeah. sharpening that edge. That's, that's really awesome. And actually you said one thing as well that, um, as much as you're an athlete, you're also a human. Mm, you're a person before you're an athlete. Yeah. What do you, What do you mean by that? Well, as I yeah, as I've kind of alluded to earlier, like I live a balanced life. Like I work for the Australian Olympic Committee. I like study at uni, and then I'm swimming thirty to thirty five hours a week. So, like trying to balance all that is is a bit of a juggling act. And having then time for friends and family is definitely like probably it's like swimming, friends, family uni then work is like mm. the priority list it's having that balance and ensuring that i'm scheduling time especially for social friends and family like that's key to me and key to getting the best out of myself and living that balanced life and living as a person as well as an athlete is yeah. something that has helped me get the best out of myself and it's not it's not for everyone and i think like i know like say arnie like obviously she has a lot of social time but she's not currently studying because she knows that it will take away from her swimming. So mm. for her, it's different to me. So everyone's an individual, and but at the end of the day, she's still trying to be a person before she's the athlete. So, and I guess the other thing is like, you'll always finish sport. Like you're not gonna go yeah. forever. So yeah. like knowing who you are and knowing the person you are and knowing the values you have. And for me, that's the thing of swimming. It's like an outlet for some of those things. and like yeah so it, it allows you to also be a person yeah yeah it allows you like i guess know yourself yeah and like actually explore who you are like when you have those dark times you definitely know where you're at you're very leveled mm. <laughs> um and humbled quite often <laughs> um and that's the thing with sport like as well like you know you are challenged every day so mm. it's like and not not more than anyone else either like i'm not underestimating anyone else and the challenges they have in outside of the sport but sport is is very it's very lucky and it's very lucky that in this country a lot of people pursue sport because you know like it's it's not life or death yeah most of the time yeah <laughs> yeah literally yeah yeah so it's like having that perspective of like you can explore who you are and explore yourself and then after that you use mm. like for me it's like well, I know I need to be balanced. So for me, like being away the last two weeks on holidays, I've been like, I'm craving normality again. Yeah. So it's like 
knowing that that's something internal that I crave and crave that balance and that busyness is something like, you know, like that I've learned from sport. Yeah. But it's like an easy avenue to learn it mm. in because it's not like, it's not like it's I've teach you. failed life, you know? Like, yeah. So for me, that's like why I swim. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Do you have any um, favorite UFC fighters? Nah, I don't. I don't follow it that closely, to be fair. But yeah, yeah. Like I, I thoughts on McGregor. <laughs> no, nah, I like Dustin. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Actually, hearing hearing his story about his broken hip and stuff, you're like, holy. What What's his deal? What's he broke his hip and like? Well, he didn't break it, but he had like extra bones in it, and they like had to fracture his hip and take all the stuff. Oh, wow. It was like six months later, he came back. It's like, what are you holy doing? Shit. Well, I mean, that makes it sound like uh, Connor can come back after a snap leg then. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, that was like crazy. But um, yeah, like to hear hear their stories and hear like how they progress and how they conduct themselves is is quite inspiring. I think like I I'm more inspired probably by like people that are themselves before anything else. So mm. like I'm very very into um Anthony Bourdain. Yes. Love, love, love watching his, his stuff. His cooking channel. Reading his stuff. It's like yeah. very cool because he just didn't give a shit about like, he was just like happy to say it how it was and happy to be himself. And like, that's something to be said because a lot of people aren't. A hundred percent. So it's like having, that's something that I've like tried to do over the last 12 months is very much be more of myself and, you know, like, having the confidence to do that is something that a lot of people don't have and something that a lot of people I think need to be more aware of like it's okay to just be yourself mm. like do you do you cook then as well yeah I love cooking yeah, yeah. what do you have any go-to dishes like um I bought a pizza oven. that's like the first thing I did when I went I was like <laughs> I'm treating myself and buying a pizza oven that's so good. I bought a like little portable pizza oven that I'll fire up tonight what's so. what's that like is that like a wood fire pizza oven or uh, wood or gas yeah so it does both so it's like about about 50 centimeters probably wow yeah and then it's like that like maybe another centimeters f- yeah um yeah and it just sits on like some legs a little portable gas bottle it's perfect that's awesome I love that, yeah. Do you know Do you know Dave Portnoy by chance? <sighs> Barstool Sports Eye. He does his own pizza reviews um, at all different joints around America and he's he's done like over 2,000 spots. But um, he's just recently brought out his own frozen pizza. Oh, yeah. And um, and he reviewed it and gave it a 10. So I was just like... <laughs> <laughs> it's made all his reviews. Like, yeah. I'm like, null now. Yeah. It's just like, well, I'm rating myself a 10. So it's like... Yeah, well, it's it's very weird the the feedback because everyone's like, oh, like, it, it's impossible. It's a ten. Like yeah. the way he's reviewed every pizza has been very strict, and he's had like a criteria for it. But um, and then he's given himself a ten, <laughs> and then he's tweeted saying like, disrespecting the Portnoy name. That's his name. Yeah. Like never. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. No, I love um David Chang. So he's a Korean American Korean chef, and his story is pretty cool. And like the person he is now he does a show called ugly delicious and then breakfast lunch dinner on netflix and ugly delicious is like a lot of people would probably have seen it but yeah it's like i just love his his take on like exploring the culture of like a food so like pizza and like going like super deep into what's detroit pizza like what's like Mm. domino's like what does pizza mean to domino's what does pizza mean to someone in naples it's like it's it's all pizza but it's like it's got its own story. Yeah, each each has their own story, and he goes through like fried chicken, steak to like, and he kind of like explores those foods, and it's it's very fascinating, and like kind of takes that Bourdain esque, if you will, like his parts unknown of like not just talking about the food, but like the country and like the cultural influence of yeah. like why the food is that today, and because of political situations, because of like who's conquered, who's like mm. been there in the past, and like the trade routes. It's like it's just fascinating to see like people like that and like him just be himself like the challenges and struggles he would have had growing up as a korean american like you know like it's nothing on what i've had challenges yeah. so it's like and him just having the confidence over time like you hear a bit about his story and like him not having the confidence but now having the confidence to be himself and like mm. it's like it's amazing like then the success he's had by being because, just yeah. himself and like it's 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 like 
something to look up to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because it's it's such a strange thing that like you have to have the confidence to be yourself. Mm, like, yeah, that's a good like point. it's a difficult thing to actually be authentic. And yeah, because like, you're so worried about what other people think about it. But like, there's so many lessons you can learn from like a Bourdain and yeah. like I said, it was David Chang, was it? Like, just some, people are drawn to the authentic more than it, they it are. It does shine the through. Like Bourdain show was, was the best. Yeah. Because he was just yeah. so himself wherever he went and you're drawn to it. It's it's fascinating that now we buy into all the um the fake beeps and all the fake fights <laughs> yeah. and for whatever reason that's entertaining. But authenticity yeah, but even, even always that, comes through, doesn't it? Always even even then through. though, like you, you watch the Paul brothers like doing all the fights they're doing and it's like, that's also inspiring. Like mm. they're just like being like, well, like I can do that too. Like yeah. it's also like they're just showing people that if you put your mind to something, you can do it. So mm. it's like, that's also like inspiring in its own regard. But like, it's also a little weird that like the YouTubers and boxers now, it's like, what are you doing? Yeah, it's, it's a weird bridge to close, but... Authentic self-belief. They've definitely yeah. got self-belief. Yeah. That's not evident. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, it's been great to chat to you. For people who want to check you out, on Instagram, Zach Stubletty. Yep. That's the name. Uh, Z-A-C-S-T-U-B-B-L-E-T-Y. Awesome. Well, <laughs> any, anywhere else? That's my handle on Instagram. all socials. So. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Well, check him out. Thanks so much for coming on the show. It's been great to chat to you. Thank you. Thanks Thank for having you. me. Thanks, guys. Thanks.